SJC 12400, Commonwealth v. Joseph DeRico. Ms. Rose. Good morning, Chief Justice Gantz, Associate Justices. My name, if it please the court, my name is Rebecca Rose, and I represent the appellant Joseph DeRico. Um, Your Honors, I see the two. There are two salient issues in this um, appeal, and both, bo the, and they apply both to the Rule 36 argument and to the constitutional claim, and that is the ambiguity in the case law regarding uh, when a defendant must object to delays, what uh, constitutes acquiescence. Um, and what constitutes benefit to a defendant and when the Commonwealth is responsible to uh, move the case along. Ms. Ms. The other Ms. Rose, could you help me with the DNA testimony for a moment, please? Mm -hmm. um, as I look at it, the, the complaining witness gave a statement, and from her testimony or her statement, one would expect for cooperation there to be some type of DNA evidence on two items, the seat cushions and the picture frame, correct? correct. Okay. And then there's delay, and you'll talk about that, um, the sequence, but there's delay in, 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 in how it's sent out to sell mark. But the bottom line is both those items come back as inconclusive in just his skin cells. There's no Correct. seminal fluid, there's no Correct, as YSTRs. Correct. DNA. Okay. Correct. It goes to trial the first time. There's a stipulation that the results are inconclusive. Oh, I, I thought the Commonwealth introduced the evidence, but um, but through only stipulation, to, correct, think, that yes. it was inconclusive. Right, right. And, and and the defense attorney in this first trial in its closing argument appropriately said it doesn't cooperate the complaining witness's testimony. Correct. We get to trial number two, and there's no mention by either side correct. of the DNA evidence, right. yes, and there's right. a conviction. Right. Okay. The Commonwealth didn't use it in the second trial. Nor, but nor did the defense attorney in the second trial. No, he did not. And in fact, this evidence would not have, it ne wouldn't necessarily have implicated him in the crime. It would have been, you know, kind of corroborating evidence, well, but it wouldn't well, have been, it, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been, um, um, it wouldn't have really helped either party. It wasn't. It wouldn't have helped the defendant at all. But that's what I'm curious about. Isn't there a view that that evidence is exculpatory? Because if the facts were what the complaining witness said, one would expect to find DNA. And I've heard that closing argument a thousand times. Well, sure, Your Honor. But in fact, DNA on his own couch isn't necessarily. Um, and whether there's DNA some other place besides on the um, co the complaining witness, it doesn't it doesn't prove that he actually raped. Oh sure, skin cells uh, on his couch is is, is a non-starter. But but if if there were, if there was seminal fluid on a YSTR DNA on a picture frame, that would be kind of damning. Well, he for wasn't the, charged with he was charged with statutory rape. He wasn't charged with any of the other evidence that came in. To um, to support that any of the that uh, the evidence of his other uh, behaviors that was um, um, uh, you know I would argue that it's propensity evidence. In fact, the defense attorney did below, S so he wasn't charged and and he was only charged with statutory rape in the basement. Right. But again, even if there had been um, semen cells on the couch or some other place in the basement, it doesn't exactly prove that he raped the victim. It, so it, it's not conclusive. It's not going to be conclusive either way, and it certainly is not going to be exculpatory to the defendant whether there was or wasn't um, it, semen on his own couch. Can you uh, uh, st staying with the DNA for a moment? Uh, Commonwealth provided the DNA analysis to you when um, the they f the. They first turned over the, finally, they, they say, the Commonwealth says in its brief that they turned over the evidence in hand on May 23rd, 2007. However, there's no evidence in the docket in the file that they actually had a discovery notice. And in, um, they, in, it looks like that the actual evidence in electronic form with the, not just the, um, not just the results. The Commonwealth says that it turned over the DNA results in hand, and I would argue that results doesn't mean anything. What's important to the defendant is 
is examining the forensic experts and looking at the actual, what actually, ha what the lab, how the lab actually analyzed it. That evidence didn't get to the defendant until September 10th, 2007, after, the, after a court order. Uh, and that's what perplexes me a little bit, because they say they provided something on 523, which I assume was a report. I mean, is that, why is the record so unclear as to usually there would be a report saying here is the opinion and then it appears on June 22nd, you seek electronic records. I'm not sure what that means. And then the, uh, the manual from the, from the lab. Uh, you know, we do not know what that is. And unfortunately, trial counsel's files have been destroyed by appellate counsel. So those, we don't have the actual, uh, def the defendant doesn't have the actual documents. But what we do have is the court file and the doc and what's in the docket, and there's nothing in the docket or the file that says the Commonwealth complied with its discovery requirement on, on May 23rd. There, it, they, there is no discovery notice uh, uh, on May 23rd. The discovery notice is filed on September 10th, 2007. But and I think we can imply that these results, the, the, whatever the results were that were served in hand, were not the CVs of the, and the, the complete folder and, and all of the evidence from the, um, from the um, uh, from the lab because they would have t said they would have put that in a discovery notice on May 23rd. Okay, so you asked for that on June 22nd. You get that on September 10th. Correct. And at that point, you have all the DNA information you would need. Well, at that point, the the defendant's expert looks at it, and in late uh, Judge Lou said late December. It looks like on the docket in early January the expert came back and said there is something missing. This is not a complete analysis. The, the YSTR testing is not, not included in this um, packet of information. And it goes back to Cellmark, and then it takes another um, until March 6th to get the complete um, analysis from the labs. So that's when you have all the DNA information. Right, on, on March 6th. And that's when they kind of get back on track for the pretrial hearings and, and uh, setting uh, yet another trial date. Ms. Rose, I, I assume you disagree with the uh, 128 from the appeals court that uh, we need not analyze the situation under Barker v. Wingo and under constitutional speedy trial grounds. Yes, Your Honor. And, and, and I, I guess... Um, sort of the question answers itself, but how, how can a rule provide more protection than the Constitution? Isn't the Constitution the minimum, the bottom of protection? And I know that we've said something differently back in um, quite a while ago in Commonwealth versus Levin, but, but doesn't this have to be analyzed under the United States Constitution? Your Honor, I believe it does, and, and this court has said that those two analyses are, are distinct, they're different analyses. The Rule 36, analysis is, uh, is, well, it's certainly not a counting exercise, as this case shows. There is quite a bit of ambiguity in the law. But the, the, rule, um, the rule sets out some clear boundaries. But the const and, and the Commonwealth is burdened with, with justifying the extensions um, the, and the extra days. In, a, in the constitutional analysis, the defendant does have to show prejudice. It's a different analysis. And the clock starts ticking at a different time. In fact, the, the constitutional speedy trial clock starts ticking at the time of indictment. Um, so, and, and so or at when, the time of the complaint, I'm oh, okay, sorry. Right, right. And, but the, but the uh, Rule 36 would be, when at, would that start? It, it, at the, the return date, which is return effectively date. the yeah. indictment. So what so, the, I'm sorry, what this case raises is so-called DNA delays, right? Correct. What do you, what do you make of, of Chapter 278A, the post-conviction request for DNA analysis, where we, we appropriately get post-conviction motions for DNA analysis where if this DNA wasn't done in this case and your client were convicted and a complaining witness had made statement about um, seminal fluid and ejaculation on seat cushions and picture frames that were never tested, don't you think a good defense attorney, post-conviction defense attorney, would bring a motion for 278A post-conviction testing? Um, well, I think it depends. It certainly, it depends on the circumstances and the facts and, and what your what one's client says. But in this case, it wasn't the defendant who asked for the DNA in the first place. In fact, the Commonwealth uh, first moved um, in back in. Um, of course, the, the Commonwealth certainly wanted to cooperate. 
this person. The, the right, and, and so and defense counsel didn't want to test it, didn't want, the only thing defense, the defendant wanted to do was look at the expert, evaluate the expert evidence that the Commonwealth planned to present at the trial. And I think, um, it, you know, in this case, and it, this goes back to um, um, who benefits here. The Commonwealth argues that the defense counsel benefited because he was the one asking for the expert and the evaluation. But again, um, I think this court has said in Taylor that it's not acquiescence when a defendant agrees to continuances. But doesn't 278 days show us the value of DNA testing? Sure, I, I, absolutely. I, I, we're not questioning the value of the DNA testing, Your Honor. We are questioning the delay, the length of time it took to get this case to trial because the Commonwealth was waiting on the DNA evidence. And then when they turned the evidence over, it still wasn't complete. And, it, and after analysis by the defendant, they had to request the complete testing. So it's, uh, we're not questioning the value of the DNA. We're questioning the, the length of the, of the delay and the violation of, of Mr. DeRico's right to a speedy trial. So what do you say should happen when DNA evidence turns out to be material, either potentially for the prosecution or for the defense? Well, Your Honor, I think that um, it, I think as Taylor says, these, each case has to be evaluated on the merits. But I do say that, that, a, con that a defendant has a right to a speedy trial and he has a right <coughs> to um, uh, both, both a procedural right and a constitutional right. And, and delays have to be justified. And in this case, it wasn't a short delay. This case took, it took, it took 947 days to get this case to trial. The Commonwealth asked for, moved for a swab of the defendant's cheek on, on January 9th of 2006. They didn't get the order. They didn't press this order. They didn't get the order from the judge for that swab until September 7th, 2006. And, uh, so they weren't even pressing this case. And what was the, cust the custody status of the defendant? Was at what? that point, he was still in custody, or he was, he, at some point, he was in custody, but he was also on, um, on probation, and he was wearing a GPS bracelet. So he was clearly accessible. That, that was not the issue. No, I just question as far as, you know, because sometimes in, in cases, there different priorities attached, for better or worse, to, to DNA testing when, for homicide cases, for instance, when people are in custody versus cases where people aren't in custody. Cases get uh, expedited through the state police. Sometimes they get sent off to Selmark. There's all sorts of variables. And in this case, I thought your client was out on bail. He, he was out on bail after, it, it was about a year. I'm sorry, I don't know exactly the date. Um, he, but he was in custody for the first, he, and he was in custody still when the first trial date came up. He was still in custody, but he was not by the, by the um, <coughs> time the trial actually happened. But again, I would argue that, that the, the, the Commonwealth was not coming to court uh, suggesting, they were not pressing their case either and suggesting to the court that they were having trouble with the DNA, the defendant didn't know that there was problems at the labs, um, and the Commonwealth wasn't even pressing to get the swab. Um, in fact, the, they didn't actually get the order to take the swab until two weeks before the first trial date, which of course came and went. So again, if there, if there are issues of priority or delay in the labs, the Commonwealth can bring that forward. They, the, I, I believe that our courts have shown that both, both sides have to um, have a responsibility to press their cases and not just uh, sit around and wait and, and um, wait for the lab and certainly to, um, to notify the court and the defense. Now, Taylor speaks about willful noncompliance or a lack of due diligence in the context of Rule 36. Uh, I don't see anywhere in the record where you've, you went before the judge and said, Your Honor, they have demonstrated willful noncompliance or a lack of due diligence with regard to the production of the DNA information and we seek sanctions, or at least we seek that the, the uh, speedy trial clock uh, not be stopped for that reason. Well, Your Honor, he, the defense counsel did not jump up and down and object. And, and this case did seem to bump along until he did file the motion finally in, um, in May of, oth of 08 saying, asking for this evidence. And I, I submit at that point, that is when he, um, he told, the, told the court, this has been a, we've been waiting for this a long time. 
and he, this was a motion for the mandatory evidence. He did not say a motion to compel under Rule 14. That, and was, I that, that, that was actually in June of 07, wasn't it? The motion for mandatory discovery you're referring to? The motion to dismiss was in May of 08. Oh, correct. Yes, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Yes. So, but the motion for mandatory discovery, as best as I can see, I mean, is it, are you claiming it is, the, it is routine when the Commonwealth furnishes DNA for them to furnish the electronic records as well as the manual? I mean, maybe it is now. It wasn't in my day, but that well, day Your was Honor, a long time ago. It is certainly routine, certainly after um, Melinda's Diaz, to make to uh, bring, to not rely on the papers, to bring the analysis, anal analysts into court to... Um, oh, no, I'm referring to the techniques. discovery. I mean, basically, they give you apparently something in May of t May 23rd, they give you something which appears to be, a, I guess, a report. We don't know. We'll hear from Mr. Charles. But then in June 22nd, you then say, no, no, we also want the electronic records and the manual. And you're claiming that that's akin to a motion for sanctions. But it would be a motion for sanctions or be akin to that if one would expect that the Commonwealth's production should have routinely included the manual and the electronic records. And I'm asking if there's anything in the record which says that's what a defense counsel should be entitled to expect when you get the DNA analysis. Well, I, I submit that results are meaningless without the analysis. Results are meaningless without knowing who did the analysis and how the analysis was done. And that we don't have evidence of until um, September of, of Isn't 2007. that clearly a Dr. Ladd um, thing where he's, he's an expert and he's mm -hmm. on a lot of these cases and Dr. Ladd says, I'll look at it, but I need the electronic data because he has to look at it. It's not part of the typical DNA production that happens in the first instance. It's when a defense expert gets involved where they want protocols and, and, and all the uh, backup data, correct? Well, I w and that's certainly what the Commonwealth is arguing. And I would argue that, in fact, the, um, that, in fact, it is meaningless unless an expert can look at it. And it's incumbent upon any defense counsel to evaluate the expert evidence that's going to be submitted at trial. And, and, and um, receiving it in the proper format for an expert to look at is um, part of, I, I would argue, part of the discovery requirement. All right, thank you. I, in fact, I would ask this court to um, dismiss the charges for lack of a speedy trial. Thank you. Mr. Charles, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, Associate Justices. Uh, may it please the court, Assistant District Attorney Jamie Michael Charles appearing for Middlesex on behalf of the Commonwealth. Um, I'd like to start by noting, uh, although as Justice Lowy touched on, we have a uh, federal claim as well. With regards to this state claim under Rule 36, it's not entirely clear to the Commonwealth and, it was, and the Commonwealth represented as such in its brief that this defendant even gets the benefit of the Taylor case. Uh, this defendant's direct appeal resolved in 2011, three years before the court's decision in Taylor came down. If you look at the language used by this court in the decision authored by Justice Lank and Taylor, under extant case law, under established principles, uh, in footnote 17 of Taylor, the court even explicitly says, um, even under the rule we announced today, it's clear that Taylor announces a change in the law. Prior to Taylor, uh, regardless of whether you're dealing with mandatory discovery, be it DNA or anything else, or uh, discretionary discovery, if a defendant acquiesces, agrees, or benefits from a delay, it was excluded from the tr speedy trial calculus. Post-Taylor, we now ask a judge where an appropriate motion is filed under Rule 14C to evaluate the specific facts of an individual case and make a determination uh, based on the affidavits and the trial record whether that time should or should not be included. So that is unquestionably a, a distinct change in the law that the defendant who was on collateral review after a 2011 affirmance of his conviction does not get the benefit of. Your so, position nonetheless is that even if Taylor applied, it wasn't complied with because we don't have, um, going back to uh, Justice Gaziano's point, clearly mandatory discovery and there's no motion for sanctions. So yes, on both, on both points. To address the motion for sanctions first, again, if you look at the Taylor case itself, I think that case illuminates the distinction between the two-line motion for mandatory discovery that was filed by the defendant in this case, and that's in his record appendix, and a motion to compel or for sanctions. In Taylor, the court recognized that a motion to compel was filed but never acted upon, and instead, the defendant filed numerous motions for mandatory discovery, and the trial judge in that case set deadlines for the Commonwealth's compliance. Similarly here, the defendant on June 22nd of 2007 files this motion for 
DNA, whether or not it was mandatory or not, I'll get to in a second. Um, and the judge on, in early September signs an order that says this shall be provided by September 11th. It was provided on September 10th. That is the same sort of motion that the Taylor court essentially, not explicitly, but by virtue of saying this defendant, Taylor, I mean, doesn't fall within the new rule we announced. They essentially said these motions for mandatory discovery are distinct from a Rule 14C motion. And both the lower court in this case, and I believe another unpublished decision of the appeals court, Commonwealth v. Rausch, which I think Justice Seifer was on the panel for, also interpreted Taylor that way to say that these generic motions for discovery that the defendant believes he is still owed that hasn't been provided are distinct from an explicit motion for sanctions under 14C. And then to the second point, with both, both uh, Justice Gaziano and the Chief Justice touched on, it is by no means the Commonwealth's burden to turn over all of this data in the first instance. While, uh, again, I will say it's not abundantly clear from the record, but I think what can clearly be inferred from the Commonwealth's original opposition and from the affidavit of the trial attorney, ADA Draper, is that what was turned over on May 22nd of 2007, or May 23rd, excuse me, was the DNA report that issued the findings of the DNA analyst. And then on June 22nd, the Commonwealth receives this motion from the defendant asking for a manual for electronic files. It is not every case that a defendant elects to hire an expert to review DNA evidence. I think this is a prime example even because the DNA results did not actually implicate this defendant. If DNA results come back and they are inconclusive or they exclude someone, there's not going to be an expert hired. There's no need to do that. So until the Commonwealth is on notice that a defendant is going to seek an expert to review the findings, it is not at all commonplace for the Commonwealth to turn over these electronic files, certainly not the manual of the lab. Um, and again, I just, just to contextualize this, because in the brief and, it, and now just that argument, my sister continues to claim that there's this offensive degree of delay. And the Commonwealth's not suggesting that this case was the most expedient uh, example of how a case should be tried. There certainly took a while to ultimately get to the finish line. But the buckle swab of this defendant was not taken until November of 2006. The Commonwealth could not conduct the DNA analysis until it had the defendant's DNA sample. So on, in November of 2006, a buckle swab of the defendant is taken. And I would note, by the way, that contrary to what my sister said, the defendant was released on bail in June of 2006 and was out with conditions, but not behind bars as of June 2006. So in November of that year, a buckle swab is obtained. By May 23rd of the following year, a period of, we're talking six and a half to seven months, the original DNA report is provided. I would submit the seven months is not an inordinate amount of time for DNA to be provided by the Commonwealth, particularly where that DNA has to be sent out to a third party lab that is not state run. Uh, the defendant then on June 22nd asks for this additional, which he believes is mandatory DNA discovery. That is provided within two and a half months on September 10th. We then uh, get the report of Dr. Ladd in early December, or excuse me, in late December of 2007. And the Commonwealth notices that in Dr. Ladd's report there is a notation about this YSTR testing. The defendant doesn't bring it to the Commonwealth's attention. The defendant doesn't file another motion for mandatory discovery or a motion for sanctions. The Commonwealth recognizes, and this is represented in ADA Draper's affidavit at uh, Record Appendix 292, that there is a notation in there about some DNA being missing. She reaches out to opposing counsel and asks him to have the expert clarify what is, he believes is still missing. And the Commonwealth says, tell us what's missing, we'll get it for you. Uh, the expert does not provide clarification until January 30th of 08, and, from, and then on March 6th of 08, that additional discovery is provided. So the Commonwealth is, being, is taking affirmative steps to try and diligently provide this discovery, whether or not it is mandatory or discretionary. This is not a circumstance as envisioned by Taylor, where there's intentional uh, dragging of the feet by the Commonwealth or negligence by the Commonwealth. You have these really discrete periods where you know, discovery is provided, the defendant asks for more, the Commonwealth provides it. It seems that there may be more needed, the Commonwealth provides it. It's not negligence, it's not willful delay on the part of the Commonwealth. So even if we want to assume that this motion that the defendant filed did fall within the rubric of Taylor, I still think that Judge Liu acted appropriately and within his discretion in concluding that this time period should not be attributed to the Commonwealth because they were taking, this was not an inordinate amount of time for DNA to be provided, and the Commonwealth was taking affirmative steps to try and get it to the defendant. And meanwhile, I would note, and we, we note in our brief, that the defendant is, is not objecting, he's not 
preserving his Rule 36 rights. He's acquiescing to delay. He's agreeing to continuances. He's agreeing to changes in the trial date. This is not, and this speaks to Justice Lowy's uh, question about the federal claim. A defendant can't claim that he suffered from prejudicial delay when he doesn't protect that right, when he doesn't file a motion for sanctions, where he doesn't object on every date to the continued delay. The first time that this defendant ever noted that he was unsatisfied with the pace at which the trial was proceeding was when he filed the Rule 36 motion in May let's, of Let's talk just big picture about sure. DNA and uh, discovery for a moment. Sure. So in certain cases, the, the, the DNA comes back, certain murder cases, the DNA comes back incredibly quickly. Agreed. Um, in, in, in other cases where it's a peripheral issue, uh, inconclusive, and it's not really going to drive um, the strategy of the prosecution of the defense, not so much. So how do we look at, at Rule 36 uh, and, and consider these delays? On the one hand, um, if, if, if somebody's doing some nudging over there with the, with the lab, it's, it's, it's going to move uh, quicker. And, and, and uh, it doesn't, it shouldn't just be the judge in first session. Um, shouldn't the prosecutor with due diligence and the defense attorney with an obligation to not acquiesce and object have some sort of responsibility here so that everything else doesn't move ahead in the queue? I, as, I agree with you 100%, and I think that that's what the current rubric envisions. That, so. I think we have, what we have to remember is that Rule 36 is an extreme remedy. The, the mandatory dismissal of a case under Rule 36 is, is the most extreme remedy that can occur in a criminal case. Rule 14 provides for a variety of, of sanctions under Rule 14c <coughs> for uh, delayed discovery, non-production of discovery in a timely manner, and the court, via the party's request, can craft necessary remedies. I, I don't think, given the severity of the, of the result, i.e. The, the dismissal with prejudice of a case, that it is too much to ask for a defense attorney to either continuously object on court dates to the continued non-production of something, if he feels like he is entitled to it and it's not being produced in a timely fashion, or to file the sort of motion that the court envisioned in Taylor. And I'm not absolving the Commonwealth completely of an obligation. We certainly need to try and be uh, proactive in getting this, and I would submit that this particular record shows that the Commonwealth was trying to do what it could to get the things to the defendant that he wanted. But that, that's why we require the objection, that's why we require the motion for sanctions, because you can't, as, as our cases have said repeatedly, you can't sit idly by, passively by, biding your time, and then spring a Rule 36 motion on the Commonwealth after not giving any inc inclination previously that this was a problem in the case. Because <coughs> dismissal with prejudice is the most extreme remedy, and we don't take it lightly in serious felony prosecutions. Um, and then, so just to uh, return to and finish my thoughts regarding the federal claim, uh, although the Commonwealth does feel, based on prior SJC case law, that this court has found that Rule 36 is as protective of, if not more protective of, the speedy trial right than the federal right, I will say that undertaking the Barker v. Wingo analysis does not help the defendant here. He didn't press his claim. Uh, he did not, he was not prejudiced by the DNA results. Uh, as Justice Gaziano noted, at the first trial, not only was there a stipulation inter entered into that stated that these results were inconclusive, the results denoted a mixture of DNA, which the defendant in closing argument used to suggest a third party culprit. So in, in essence, he benefited somewhat from this DNA evidence in the first trial. And, he, and I mean, it clearly was useful to him because it resulted in a mistrial, not a conviction. Uh, the Commonwealth did elect in the second trial not to use this DNA evidence, but I don't think that that should cloud the fact that at, this, at the very first trial that the defendant faced on, this tri on, this, uh, on these charges, he benefited from the results of this DNA, which was inconclusive at best and helpful to him at worst. And finally, I would note that the only prejudice that uh, my sister seems to claim he actually suffered from is this cloud of suspicion that he lived under pre-trial. And I would note that in the Barker case, which was a five-year delay, the, court essentially, the Supreme Court essentially recognized that while the defendant did live under a cloud of suspicion where he couldn't identify any other tangible prejudice that he suffered in terms of lost evidence um, or compromised witnesses, uh, that that cloud of suspicion was not enough to justify the dismissal of a case under uh, federal speedy trial grounds. So I would say that this case is remarkably similar to Barker v. Wingo in that, con in that sense. And, and here we have a defendant who pressed his case even less and who wasn't really prejudiced in any tangible way by the DNA, ev oh, excuse me, by the DNA evidence that was ultimately produced. Um, so uh, if there are no further questions, I would ask 
that this court there, uh, there, 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 there are some further questions. Uh, one is sort of a technical one. Uh, <clears throat> I see from the docket that Judge Borenstein allowed the motion for mandatory discovery the same day, uh, <clears throat> and then September 4th issues an order to produce them. Uh, any reason why he would have needed an order when he had allowed the motion for mandatory discovery the same day it was heard? On June 22nd, he allowed the motion and the Commonwealth indicated that it would reach out to Selmark to produce the additional uh, discovery requested. On September 4th, which was one of the scheduled court dates, that discovery had still not been produced and the defendants uh, asked that the court issue an order setting a finite date because although the judge allowed the motion on June 22nd, he didn't set a deadline on June 22nd for the provision of that additional discovery. So he said, yes, Commonwealth, you do have to provide that, but he did not say by X date. And so on September 4th, at the defendant's request, the judge asked the Commonwealth to draft an order, which it did and which the judge signed, which set September 11th as the deadline for the provision of those additional discovery materials. And the Commonwealth did comply with that and provide those materials on September 10th. Now here, I guess that the trial date was affirmatively moved back a number of times. That's correct. So there were trial dates set, those trial dates were continued. Yes, this wasn't a weed berry situation where we had no finite date set and the case was just moved along. Um, initially the case uh, was delayed because the defendant obtained a new attorney in late 2006 and thus uh, proceedings essentially had to reset, discovery had to be provided a second time. And then I would suggest that the additional agreed upon continuances of the trial date was due to this ongoing, not dispute, but the necessity of additional discovery for the defendant's uh, expert to review the DNA results that have been provided by the Commonwealth. And, and in a better world, when those continuances are sought, should the judge have done an ends of justice finding with regard to speedy trial? I do think there's this inherent tension between this plain language of Rule 36, which does call for that finding by a judge, and the separate body of law that states that ir uh, irrespective of a finding by the judge, if there's acquiescence or agreement, it's excluded. So I do think there's some tension there, and it probably would have benefited from a finding by the judge. But again, I don't think it is an, an overly burdensome request of defense counsel that they stand up and at the very least object to the delay. If it is that, if it is that prejudicial to their client to have to continue to wait for a key, what they seem to feel is a key piece of evidence, I think asking that they stand up and say, we object, we do not waive Rule 36, we think this should have been provided already, is not, is not overly burdensome uh, where the end result is the dismissal of a case with prejudice. So what I'm hearing, I think, you can correct me, is that you're saying that when there's a request to continue and the, common, and the defense does not object, uh, a judge could sua sponte make an ends of justice determination, but that the objection to the continuance would trigger that finding to justify the continuance. Yes, I think, I think that that's a fair assessment of what, of what is said. Or at the very least, it would, it would necessitate a finding if the judge wanted to grant the continuance over the defendant's objection. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.